let's get started. So with clean architecture, the domain and the application layer are at the center of the design. This is known as the core. Now, the domain contains enterprise logic and types and the application layer contains business logic and types. The difference being that enterprise logic could be shared across many systems, whereas business logic would only be typically used in this application. Now, rather than have core depend on concerns such as data access and infrastructure, we invert those dependencies. So infrastructure and presentation depend on core, but core has no dependencies. This is achieved by adding interfaces or abstractions into core, which are then implemented by the outside layers. So you can see with this design, all dependencies point inwards. And this results in an architecture and design that is independent of frameworks. We don't need some framework to build and maintain our solution. It's testable, and in fact, it's really, really easy to test. With everything inside of core, we can write unit tests for 100% of our logic, and it's all logic. As I said, it's business logic and enterprise logic. It's independent of the UI. Right now we're using an ASP.NET Core 3 front end with Angular 8, but we can switch that out and it's easy to do so. And that's because inside of Core, we have well-defined view models and all of our logic is encapsulated. We haven't let any of that logic creep into the front end. It's independent of the database. Right now we're using SQL Server. We switched it successfully to Postgres. Later on we're gonna switch it to Cosmos DB, probably back to Postgres again. And we can do that because we have a wonderful abstraction in place. And finally, it's independent of anything external. And with this design, that's the difference between an application that's going to last three years and an application that's still going to be here in 20 years. Now you can see with these layers, there's only three. But think of this as a starting point, you can add more. If you need to, add additional layers, just remember to keep those dependencies flowing inwards. Well, let's take a look at a couple of examples. So when I first started um, doing this talk in 2018, we were using the Northwind Traders sample solution. Why, you might ask? Well, because I still think Northwind Traders is cool and I wanted to share it with the world. And the good news is I wasn't wrong. This project has taken off. It's now starred by almost 3,000 people and forked by almost 1,000 people. And that's amazing. So I wanted to take a moment to thank that community. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for your pull requests. Thank you for the tough questions. Um, thank you for your support. It's amazing. Keep that up. But based on Northwind Traders, I've now built a clean architecture template. And with this template, I now have a very simple file new project experience. And that's what it's all about, right? KISS. Keep it simple. So we're going to use this template today and have a look at some of the features that I've built into it. And then at the end, I'll show you how to install it and how to get started. can't actually see my mouse. That's tricky. We'll work with it. Okay, so you can see here in the Ar clean architecture template, we've got basically a sample application. Now I started this off by going file new project with an Angular ASP.NET Core solution and then built in a clean architecture backend with all the features we've come to know and love from, um, from the Northwind Traders solution. So you can see here, we've got the domain layer the application layer, the infrastructure layer, and the web UI layer. In addition to that, we've got a bunch of tests. So for domain and application, we've got unit tests, and for infrastructure and web UI, we've got integration tests. Zoom in out. Hopefully I get my mouse back. Okay, so the key points. Domain contains enterprise-wide logic and types. The application contains business logic and types. Remember, enterprise can be shared across many systems, but the business logic is specific to this application. Infrastructure contains all external concerns, and that now includes persistence. Presentation and infrastructure depend on only on application, but they don't depend on each other, and that way we ensure that these components can be replaced with minimal effort. But just take a moment to think about presentation infrastructure relationship. It's very easy to go ahead and add a dependency to infrastructure and then start using infrastructure services. For example, in the web front end, we might want to send an email. And it's easy enough to do in a controller, but then that's logic in the front end. And we need to keep that logic out of the front end um, because it can't be reused. All right, 
let's have a look at the domain layer. So in the domain layer, we have entities, value objects, enumerations, logic, and exceptions. Hey, my mouse came back. That's so good. I'm really pleased about that. So the first thing that I want to point out in the domain layer is to avoid using data annotations. So you can see here, we've, we've kept this solution simple because it's a file new project solution. We're going to be adding our own entities. But you can see, nonetheless, I have a to-do item and I haven't used data annotations. And, and why is that? Well, I want to keep my, keep my domain model clean. I want to keep data annotations out of my domain model. Later on, when we look at infrastructure, of course, we'll look at using Fluent API configuration, which will help with our ORM mapping. Um, but for now, we'll keep it clean. Um, one thing you can see there is I've also got an auditable entity base class on this. So this solution is jam-packed with examples. Auditable entity is one of those. Just by attaching that base class to this entity, we'll actually have a number of fields auto-populated um, when save changes is fired, including the user ID who created it, the date time they created it, the user ID who modified it, and the date time that it was last modified. So one of the um, key points I'd like to make is using value objects. So I have a sample value object in here, and it's an AD account. And you might be thinking, well, AD account's pretty trivial. Why not just use a string? And that's because it's not a string. It's, um, it has specific logic that's associated with it and specific logic that we'll have to write when we use it. For example, um, it's often common when you're using an AD account to grab the domain part and to use that. It's often common to also grab the username part, and you also need to display it um, in its normal format. So this value object actually encapsulates all of that. You can see it's got a factory, which will take in an account string, split it up into a domain and name, and it will throw an invalid exception if the format's not supported. And you might think, well, why bother throwing that exception? Um, and it's because it's a custom exception, and it's something that we can understand. Um, AD account invalid exception is much easier to understand than index out of range exception. So you can see here, it's pretty simple. It's just got a couple of properties, domain and name, and we have some unit tests associated with that, which make it really easy to understand how it works. So looking in here, we've got a test should have correct domain and name, and basically we take an account string, we use the factory method to construct an account, and then we assert that those properties are correct. So you can see that it's quite easy to use. And it's going to be easy for new developers to use as well. They're not going to think, uh, how do I work with this AD account object? It's a string. What logic do I have to write? It's all built into it. So then we have a two-string method. We check that it returns the correct format. We have an implicit conversion method, which basically can take an AD account, implicitly convert it to a string, and it should be the correct account string. Um, we have an explicit conversion method, where we can cast an, AD, uh, an account string into an AD account test those results, and we've got a quick test to ensure that if the format's invalid, such as it is here, SSW JSON, no backslash, um, that it throws that exception. So this is really simple to use. So you just have to think about um, when you're defining your entities and you're utilizing primitive types, is it really a primitive type or is it something more complicated? Is a postcode just an integer or is it a complex system with rules that are associated with it that you're going to have to program into your application and those rules which could start appearing in many places throughout your application because there's not a central location. So pretty simple. Um, one thing to point out is that behind the scenes here, there is a value object base class and that's basically um, about equality. So two value objects are the same if they share the same value what this does is get all of the values associated with the value object and compare them. So that implementation actually came from the Microsoft Docs, so you can learn more about it here. Okay, one point that I like to make, and this is a simple point, is just in your entities, make sure that you initialize all collections and also set them to uh, have a private setter or just remove the setter altogether. And it might seem like a trivial thing, but it really helps, and especially helps new developers. If you don't do that, you'll be writing logic such as um, order.orderDetails, and you'll check if order.orderDetails equals null, then order.orderDetails equals a new collection. And you'll have that logic start to appear all over the place, wherever you're dealing with order.details. By doing it this way, it's always initialized. It doesn't matter whether you created a new order yourself 
or whether it came back from Entity Framework. Um, and new developers won't have this problem. They won't kind of um, run into the issue. And if they do try to initialize it, because it's got a private setter, they're gonna see, actually, that doesn't work. Um, I can't actually do that. Um, that's not the way they do things within these solution. So we're actually teaching our developers how to work with this solution and how to fall into the pit of success. We make it easy to do the right thing and hard for them to do the wrong thing. One other thing that I've changed in this solution um, is I've added a, let me see, oh, that's the North Wind one. In this one, I've added an interface for iDate time. So previously, I had that in a common project as a cross-cutting concern, but I just thought, why have it there? Why not move it to the very center of the design so that everywhere in the application, it's easy to add, and we don't actually have um, a common project that has to be a dependency on every other project. It's just there, it's ready to use, and it's implemented within inf infrastructure. So that's it for the domain layer. Key points I'd like to make there is avoid using data annotations. There's a better way we can keep our entities clean. Use value objects where appropriate. Just think, is it really a primitive type or is it something more complex than that? Initialize all collections and use private setters. Create custom domain exceptions because they're a lot easier to debug and automatically track changes using auditable entity. We're gonna take another look at that at the implementation once we get to the infrastructure layer. Oh, and avoid dependency on the system clock uh, with iDate time. And why would we wanna do that? Well, because the system clock is, an, is infrastructure. It's an external dependency. And if we had logic that depends on, say, something like datetime.now, and that logic is only going to run on a Tuesday, we can only test that effectively on a Tuesday. We'll have to have an if statement or something that says, hey, is today Tuesday? We can run this unit test, otherwise we'll wait. So by doing an iDate time, we can mock that out, and then we can uh, make it to be whatever we want it is. So now let's have a look at the application layer. So in the application layer, we've got interfaces. So those are the abstractions and interfaces um, that are going to be implemented by the outside layers. We'll see those. We'll have models, view models, and DTOs. We'll have logic, commands and queries. We're gonna look at that. Validators and exceptions. So first up, I wanna introduce a concept. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. CQRS, the Command Query Responsibility Segregation Pattern. So with this, we actually separate our reads, our queries, from our writes, our commands. And this can result in maximizing performance, scalability, and simplicity. But for me, it's all about the simplicity. And the first time I tried it, I was amazed at how simple I was make, able to make my system just by following this pattern. It's easy to add new features when we're following this pattern because we can just add a new query or command. So generally, a feature is going to relate to one query and or one command. And it's easy to maintain because our changes only affect a single command or query. Um, we try to encapsulate everything that belongs to that command or query into a single folder so that we, when we go to that folder, everything that we need to update that feature can be changed in the one place. We try to minimize sharing between those commands and queries so that we can avoid breaking changes. We do encourage code reuse, just not when it's a different feature. So if you like CQRS, you'll love Mediator. Perfect, perfect partnership. So with Mediator, we can do some simple things such as defining commands and queries as requests. So we use iRequest and iRequest Handler. But after that, our application layer just becomes a series of request response objects. So everything in our application layer is either a command or query. We define them as requests and then we have this basic pipeline. And that's the next point. We get the ability to attach additional behavior before and or after each request, such as logging, validation, caching, authorization, and so on. So I'm gonna give you um, two examples in this presentation. One to automatically validate every request that comes into the system, and another to automatically log every request that comes into the system. So let's have a look. So the first point I wanna make is using CQRS to simplify our system design. So if we come to this application layer here, you can see, um, and especially if you know Northwind Traders, I've tried to clean it up significantly. Really what I wanna see here is just feature folders, and now I have just this common folder. And that common folder contains all of the infrastructure. So we're gonna look at these, but right now I wanna focus on these feature folders. So 
Um, there's basically two features in this template. There's a to-do items list and there's the existing weather forecast list, which I've moved the logic from that from the controller into the back end, into the application layer. Let's have a look at the two items, commands and queries. So you can see there that we have great clarity just from the folder structure. If we want to modify the feature that gets the to do items file, um, we know where to go. Everything that we need to modify that feature is in there. It's the same with create, delete and update. So it's very easy to navigate. You can see here I have a create to do item command and its responsibility is to create a new to do item. You can see I've got a create to do item command validator and that's because this is partly a DTO for everything that we need to create a to do item and we need a validator for that. So the, the, the behavior, so the responsibility of the validator of course is to validate um, the create to do item command. Let's have a look at this interesting um, create to do items file. So it's got a get to do items file query and I'll make that bigger. And you can see its dependencies right up the top here. It ha it's dependent on iApplication DB context, which is an interface for working with our DB context. It's dependent on the mapper. Um, this solution is using auto mapper now. And, and it's dependent on this iCSV file builder. So you can see its dependencies are all on interfaces. There's actually no dependencies on infrastructure, even though what it's doing is something very much related to infrastructure. And if we come down here, we can see it's quite simple. Um, we grab the records from the database. We do a projection, which we'll look at shortly. Um, we then call our uh, infrastructure service file builder to build a to-do items file. We pass it the records. We construct a view model and we return that. So really, w when this request is made, um, what they'll get back is a view model. So you can see that we're really simplifying the design. And not only that, because we're moving away from d domain services um, in this implementation, we actually have a single file for each feature in our system, rather than a domain service that has a, a collection of kind of related features, we just have a single file and it's really easy to find, it's really easy to modify and it's really easy to avoid breaking changes. One of the things that you may have noticed that I've done here is that I've actually nested the handler inside of the query and that improves discoverability greatly. Um, when new developers start working with this solution, They'll go to the to-do items controller and they'll say, I want to look at this get to-do items list query. Now, if I had separate files, it would be easy for them to navigate to the query, but they wouldn't see the handler. I want them to be able to see both. So we press F12 on that, we go to the query, we can see the handler, um, and it's just a nice experience for them. They don't kind of have to even pick up the mouse to, to make the changes that they need to make. Now we talked about how we're using Mediator with this solution for our commands and queries, and you can see that here. So we're defining this get to do items list query as an I request, a Mediator I request, and it's going to return the type to do items list VM. So it's very simple to define that. And then we have the request handler, and you can see here, it's a request handler for a get to do items query, which returns a to do items list VM. So that's all of the kind of plumbing we need to do to define all of our commands and queries as requests. And with that, we get some really wonderful benefits. So we essentially get this pipeline where we can add cross-cutting concerns. So if you have a look in here, I've added three cross-cutting concerns. I've got a request logger, a request performance behavior, and a request validation behavior. Let's look at the logger. So the logger is responsible for logging every request that comes through the application layer. So every command and query that comes through the application layer will be logged. It's using um, .NET Core's built-in logger and it takes in an I current user service and an I identity service. So this solution is using ASP.NET Core identity. Obviously, I don't want a dependency on identity in my core, so I've made an interface so that I can have the implementation elsewhere. You can see it's quite simple. Essentially, it gets the name of the request, it gets the user ID from the current user service, and then it gets the username from the identity service. And then it logs all of that information out to, out to um, the .NET Core logger. Um, and depending on which provider you have associated with that is where the log will end up. So that's for every single request. 
um, with a single, a single file. Now I also have a performance logger. So this request performance behavior is a little bit different. Th the request logger was just running before each request. This one runs during each request. It's part of the pipeline. So we're injecting the same services, but essentially we start a timer, a, um, a, a um, system.diagnostics timer. Uh, we wait for the request to finish. We get the response. We stop the timer. And we're saying if the elapsed milliseconds was greater than 500, then we're going to log a warning to the database. So a, so a similar um, kind of effect, um, but it shows how we can use a behavior to do something before and or after uh, each request comes through the pipeline. And the last one that I've got is the request validation behavior. But I better show you how validation works first. So I've got a very simple validator here using fluent validation. Now, of course, I could use data annotations, and they're great for simple validation scenarios, but they don't work so well for complex validation scenarios. If I wanted to do cross-field validation or if I wanted to interact with some service as part of that, I can do that effectively with um, fluent validation. This one is quite simple. Um, it's basically saying that the name property is a, minimum, a maximum length of 200, and it shouldn't be empty. Uh, if we have a look at the Northwind Traders solution, We've got a slightly more complex validator. You can see here we've got kind of standard simple rules, but then down here we've got a rule for the postal code. We basically say when the country is Australia and um, the postal code, um, the postal code must have four digits. And so if that fails, we'll say the Australian postcodes must have four digits. And we've also got a rule for the phone number. So we say it must have a Queensland landline. So we're coming down here and we're actually looking at two properties on, on the model. We're saying that the phone or the fax must start with 07 or that will fail. Um, so we can do complex, more complex validation, including validation on child collections as well. Um, and we can also inject services with that. We just have to be careful of the scope of those services. So coming back here, we have these validators and you can see how they're associated with the command. So it's basically an abstract validator, create, create to do item command. Now, if we come to the request validation behavior, then we just have this single behavior to validate all requests that are coming into the system. So you can see we essentially grab the validation context, we check to see if there's any validators, and if there's any failures, then we return a validation exception. Later on, when we look at the front end, we'll see how that's actually transa translated using a custom exception middleware to return that into a more normalized response for an API, such as a bad request or a not found, those sorts of things. Okay, the next thing that I wanted to show you is that I've implemented something that I'm, that I'm really excited about, and that's AutoMapper. I know not everyone's excited about AutoMapper, but I've done it in a way where I think it's going to be a really great experience, and I think that I'm not gonna run into too many troubles. So the first thing that I did was to use one of the new C Sharp um, 8 features, which is a default implementation for an interface. So you can see here, I have an interface I map from type. So I'm essentially able to say I map from um, to do item in this example, and I can add that to my DTO, and we'll have a look at that. And then I have this mapping um, method, and I've got a default implementation for the interface. And it basically says, I'm gonna create a map I'll map from um, to do item to to do item DTO, and what that does is it creates just a natural convention-based mapping for AutoMapper. So if this mapping is very straightforward and it's conventions-based, you won't need to do anything more. Let's have a look at that in the to do in the context of a to do item. So there you go, you can see this mapping is straightforward, it is convention based, we don't need to do anything else. That's now mapped, it's recognized by AutoMapper, and we can go ahead in our query, and we can just say project to, and that's it. Um, we can also do nested projections in the same way. If we have a look at a more complex example on this one, Actually, no, it's in uh, employees. 
So in the get employee details, it's actually not a conventions-based mapping. There is some handling we have to do. So all we had to do was actually implement the interface. So we add the mapping by profile, we create the map, and then we, then we add any, any custom mappings that we'd like to have. So you can see here um, that for member ID on the, on, the, um, on the DTO, which is right at the top here, that's going to be mapped from the employee ID. And then you can see down the bottom here that we're mapping a child collection. So we've got this collection of territories um, and we're mapping it from employee territories. So if we go to the employee territory DTO, you can see it also implements IMAP from and it specifies the mapping profile. Now we don't actually have to do anything else because I've added um, a little helper class to wire it all up automatically for us because now I can set and forget. So you can see the mapping profile um, will apply mappings from assembly, which is this method here. And it essentially scans the assembly to find any types that implement IMAP from. And then it calls the mapping method. It calls the mapping method either from the um, derived type, if, if the mapping method has been implemented, or from the interface, if it hasn't been implemented. And that's it. Very simple, so it's invoking math mapping for each of those, so we don't have to. We, we can just add IMAP from, and it's a done deal. Now there's one more thing that I've done which is really important um, for, for the work around AutoMapper, which is to add some tests. And the tests are really simple, and they're gonna kinda help me with 80% of the issues I'm likely to experience. So you can see here, I've got the assert configuration as valid. And that will basically check the mappings that I've, I've, I've created and make sure that the properties in the DTOs have been correctly mapped. And then I also have a list of the maps that I expect to exist. So I'm expecting there to be a map from a to-do item to, to a to-do item DTO and to, to a to-do item VM. It's my responsibility to put those in there. If I do forget, then obviously I'm gonna get a runtime error. This is the first place I'm gonna come. I'm gonna add that in and then I'll be protected in the future. So these two tests are just gonna help in a big way. Um, I've found them to be very useful and I'm not running into many problems at all. And as you can see, it's trivial for me to do projections. I'm not writing projections, um, except in the most complex of cases, even with nested projections. So I'm very, ha I'm very happy with that result. One of the other things that I've done in, um, the, in, in many of the layers is just to add a dependency injection extension. And so you can see with this extension here um, that we're basically just configuring our services. So um, in our web project in startup, we just go services.addapplication because it's an extension method and we're adding auto mapper, mediator and those couple of behaviors that we've created. Um, and that just cuts down on the amount of code that's in startup.cs when we're wiring up dependencies in there. So it provides a nice clean approach and also means that kind of the dependency injection that we're handling in application layer and infrastructure layer is actually in the layers. So let's see. So we've looked at the behaviors. We've got some custom exceptions. So for example, in the, um, uh, let me see, in the to-do items, if we try to get a to-do item that doesn't exist, um, it throws a not found exception. Um, and then in our custom middleware that we've got on the front end, it converts that into a 404 and returns that to the client. Uh, we have a lot of interfaces, so you can see there's an I application DB context, so we're trying to get good separation of concerns from um, our, our um, infrastructure project there. We've got our CSV file builder, which we'll have a look when we get to infrastructure, our current user service, and our identity service. I think that covers everything I'd like to cover in that layer. So let's go back. Okay, so key points for the application layer. Using CQRS plus Mediator simplifies your overall design. Um, it gives us a single pipeline in which we can implement a lot of the same behaviors that we'd like to implement as cross-cutting concerns. Fluent validation is useful for all validation scenarios. Yes, we could use data annotations for our simple validations, but we can use fluent validation for simple and complex validation scenarios. AutoMapper simplifies our mapping and projections, and we've got some tests behind the scenes to help back that up and keep that working nicely. 
and this is uh, application layer is independent of the infrastructure and data access concerns. We've been very careful to use interfaces and to keep the implementations outside of this project. So next, we're going to have a look at the infrastructure layer. So the infrastructure layer contains our persistence concerns, our identity concerns. We're using ASP.NET Core identity. It's files, things related to the file system perhaps, the system clock and API clients, essentially anything external. Now in this solution, I've used one project but there's nothing stopping you for a particularly um, complex infrastructure component creating a second project. And the way that I would do that um, is call it infrastructure dot, say, identity, if I had a lot, of, a lot of identity work. But for this solution, and for a lot of my solutions, I can, I can actually get by with just one project because we can separate things by folders as well. It's not necessary always to create lots and lots of projects. So before we get into this, when we talk about persistence, we often talk about the unit of work and repository patterns. And I thought that this was, had been put to rest. Um, but then I saw a big argument flare up on Twitter the other day. Um, and some of, some of the best people were just arguing, you know, we should still be using the repository pattern. No, we don't need it. It's not useful for anything. So I want to show a hands. Who thinks we should implement these patterns? OK, about 20% of the room. Who thinks we shouldn't? Awesome. So look, the thing is, it's not always the best choice because EF Core insulates your code from database changes. It in itself is an abstraction. Um, the DB context acts as a unit of work and the DB set acts as a repository. So if we're looking to get the primary advantages from those two patterns, that is abstraction from our database, um, we don't need to do that. EF Core already does that for us. Um, in the past, we would always implement these patterns because it was the only way we could effect effectively test logic that depended on these things. But we don't need to do that anymore because we have tools such as EF Core in memory to do that for us. But I'm not saying you shouldn't use the unit of work and the repository pattern, just as I'm not saying you shouldn't use the singleton pattern. I'm saying design patterns are there to solve a problem. All you need to know is what problem you're trying to solve and then implement the appropriate design pattern. So for example, if you were creating a repository because you only wanted a repository at an aggregate route and you didn't want access to um, entities at, at lower levels, such as um, you wanted to provide your client with access to order, but not directly to order details. If they want to manage order details, then they go through the repository. That's a good reason to implement that pattern, okay? Another reason why you might implement the unit of work pattern and the repository pattern is because you wanted abstraction not from your database, but from Entity Framework Core. You want an abstraction from your chosen ORM. That's a good reason to implement that pattern if that's important to you for the system that you're designing. So it's a design pattern. Use it to solve a problem that you're having. What do the experts think? This is interesting. So this is Jimmy Bogard. He's at this conference. He's probably not in my talk, hopefully. And he thinks, I'm over repositories and definitely over abstracting your data layer. So he's against it. And then we have Steve Smith, and he says, no, you don't need a repository, but there are many benefits and you should consider it. And he's being diplomatic. If you've heard Steve talk about repositories, he loves them, and I think if you went to him and said, hey, Steve, I'm thinking about not using a repository for this, he'll tell you why you should. And he has excellent reasons for doing so. And then we have John Smith, and he says, no, the repository slash unit of work pattern isn't useful with EF Core. So even the experts agree, but I think keep it simple. Remember, it's a design pattern. It's there to solve a problem. Just make sure you know the problem that you're trying to solve. So let's have a look at the infrastructure layer. I don't have a mouse cursor again. And it's back. Wonderful. Okay, so you can see in the infrastructure layer, I've separated kind of the features that are built into it by files, uh, sorry, by folders. So you can see I have a files folder, and that's where I've put my CSV file builder along with some maps. We'll look at that. I've got my ent identity folder, and those are the things that I'm using that are related to identity. I have my persistence folder, which is where all of my EF core stuff is stored. And I have my services folder, which is just my date time service. Let's have a look at the persistence folder first because I want to come back to configuration of entities. So I said, you know, we're not going to use data annotations, but we are going to use fluent API configuration. 
So you can see here, I've got a very simple example where we're actually just saying, hey, this name has a max length of 200 and it is required. And all that's going to do is construct, uh, instruct our ORM how to map that to the relational database if we're using a relational database. There's some more complex examples over in the Northwind solution. So if I bring up one of the configurations there. Oh, shoot. This one? Oh, that's not very complex. This one. So you can see that we're configuring a lot more properties. Most of it is relatively simple. Some of it is because of the schema that was designed for Entity Frame, uh, sorry, for Northwind Traders. It's a, a little bit non-standard. Um, but you can see that with this fluent configuration, we're keeping it out of our domain and out of our entities. And there's actually a lot of things that you can't do with data annotations when it comes time to configuring your ORM. So you'll have to use fluent configuration anyway. So why not have it all in the same place? Um, now when, you, when you're using those configurations, there's a handy little method which you can use to apply all configurations from your assembly. And you can see there, it's just apply configurations from assembly and we're saying, hey, everything from this assembly. Okay. So one thing that I wanted to show you um, in relation to the DB context that I've created is the save changes method. It's actually responsible for implementing the auditable entity feature and it's on save changes. So you can see here it's quite simple, but you can extend this example to be whatever it is that you want. If you want to track value changes, this is where you'll come to and start to implement that. So you can see on save changes async, it basically gets any entries that are implementing auditable entity. If the entity state is added, which means we're going to insert it into the database, it goes ahead and sets the created by, the user ID of the, who created this entity, and the created, the date time, um, dot now. So this is coming from our service, um, which is backed by an infrastructure implementation. Same thing for modified. Um, we grab the user ID, assign it to last modified by, and the date time dot now, and assign it to last modified, and then we save our changes. So that's a very nice way uh, to implement that. Um, one, one point to note here um, that, that could catch you out. Um, in, in the past, it, when we overrode on model creating, we could actually leave out this base dot on model creating because it, in the .NET Core code, it didn't actually do anything. Well, now it does. With, with ASP.NET Core identity, if you're using identity, um, that line is required and if you leave it out, it'll break. Okay, so I'll show you um, some of the work that I've been doing around identity. Because obviously with the implementation um, of ASP.NET Core Identity in this, we want to be able to access some of those identity services in um, our application layer. Um, so I've implemented a few. You've seen get users by, uh, get username async um, being used in some of those behaviors. Um, I've also implemented a create user async and a delete user async. What's important about this is not really what it's doing, it's the fact that we've implemented this, which is an application layer interface, and we can now use this logic in our commands and queries. So we can continue to build this out. We can start to work with user roles and claims and all that sort of thing. Um, we can even separate this into a couple of services, whatever it is that our needs are, but this shows how you can get started doing that. It was one of the most requested features for Northwind traders, was just to see kind of that identity experience and how that would flow through to the application layer and how users could interact with it. Um, something that I have to do commonly on projects is to generate CSV files. And in the past, I would use uh, file helpers. And it, it's a great tool. But unfortunately, I couldn't get it to work nicely within this solution architecture because we have to decorate our DTOs with a lot of attributes so, uh, related to the creation of a CSV file. So I found a new tool, uh, which is a very popular tool, called CSV Helper. Um, and the wonderful thing about this is it allows us to create file maps inside of our infrastructure to define how these things will be implemented within the CSV file. So we have this DTO, which belongs to the application layer, and we have this map, which will define how it's going to end up in the CSV file. So with that implementation, it's very clean. We can just build our CSV file builder, which I still have to make generic. And we can basically take in a bunch of records from our application layer, 
write it out to CSV. Um, it'll, it'll use the maps and then return the memory stream. So if you remember, we were using that in um, this query and then we're returning the results back to um, the client. So the dependency injection in this one is, uh, sorry, in infrastructure is interesting too, just a little bit, just because I've passed over um, the configuration and the web host environment, okay? So I passed that over from startup and so that allows me to just configure this, this layer with, with a few more options. So you can see I'm adding the DB context and grabbing the co uh, uh, connection string. Um, but I'm also looking at the environment to see how I should configure Identity Server. There's a lot of tests associated with this project, and now that we're using Identity Server, we have to have authenticated tests. And so if it's in the test environment, we um, add a, a test client. Um, you can see we're uh, basically enabling the resource owner flow, and we add a test user. So that makes our testing very easy. If it's not, um, then we're just add wiring up these services. Um, we don't wire up the date time service, the identity service, or the CSV file builder service in test. We have just mocks that we're using for that because there's only so much we want to test. So the important thing, and I, th I think I've made this point, is that no layers should depend on infrastructure. Um, um, and, and that can be a little bit confusing at first, but we have to remember that infrastructure is there just to provide an implementation. Now having said that, the web project does have a dependency on infrastructure. That's for dependency injection only. So we should only see the reference to infrastructure in the startup.cs. So if you see it outside of startup.cs in a controller, you know that's a red flag. Hopefully you'll pick that up as part of the code review. Now you can implement more complex behavior such as assembly scanning to wire up your dependency injection, but I find that to be a, a little bit um, over the top. Um, we have code reviews, we have pull requests, so I tend to pick those things up. So key points there, um, infrastructure um, is independent of the database. Um, I didn't actually show that, let me just show that quickly. Um, so we know and love um, Entity Framework Core, at least a lot of us. Um, so you can see that with Entity Framework Core, we have these providers. So you can see, um, let me find it, there we go. My mouse is gone again. SQL Server. So it's that provider reference that allows us to remain independent of the database. So uh, Entity Framework Core is one big abstraction, and we use providers to define um, which database we'll be interacting with. We can switch that out for Postgres, and the solution will still work. We just have to rebuild our migration. Okay, so we prefer to use Fluent API configuration over data annotations. We can do more with Fluent API configuration. We prefer conventions over configuration. So I didn't touch on that, but that's an important point. When you're working with these convention-based frameworks, such as AutoMapper and such as EF Core, it's really important to know the conventions. So take the time to learn them. That just means reading the documentation because these conventions allow us to write less code and allow us to write code that's simpler, easier to understand. But if you don't know the conventions, then you're gonna end up um, writing things that you don't need to, okay? So it's important. So we automatically apply all entity type configurations in our DB context using the little helper method. And we can know that no layers depend on the infrastructure layer, for example, the presentation layer. We wanna keep that logic out and within the um, core of our solution. So next we're gonna have a look at the presentation layer. So in the presentation layer is basically our client. We could be, we could have a Spark client. This one's Angular. It could be a web API, Razor Pages, MBC, Web Forms, Blazor, whatever we want. It's, it's not gonna be too hard to change our front end now because we have a really nicely defined core. It's dealing with really well-defined view models. And so all of our logic's inside of there and not in the front end. Let's have a look. Do I have a mouse? Yes. Great. So the first thing that I want to touch on is that controllers should not contain any logic. Um, and we're going to have a look at the history of the Northwind products controller for that. Uh, so you can see this products controller in the beginning was a very typical example of how we build controllers. We'd go ahead and inject the context, um, we would return entities, um, and we had lots of logic in there. And, and the reason that we had log logic in there was because there was nowhere else to put it. We had taken 
a very high level concept such as the controller on the outer edges of our application and injected something that was in the lowest levels of our application, the DB context, where else are we gonna put our logic? Um, so it was kind of a trap right from the beginning. And of course we know returning entities from the controller was just asking for trouble. Circular references, security issues, all of those things. So this wasn't a very good state. Okay, so let's have a look. We very quickly did an update and we were working with commands and queries at this point. And you might think, well, that's not much of a change. Well, well you probably think actually that's a crazy change. Look at all those things being injected. Um, but it was still good. We could see what this controller depended on in order to operate. I'm not sure why that's there. Never noticed that before. Oh my God, now I've got to look. That's weird. It's not being used, never noticed it. All right, but regardless, we have our queries <laughs> and our commands, they're being injected, and our, our actions have become simple, they're trivial, we're also returning DTOs, we're not returning entities anymore. And look, they've become one or maximum two lines of code. So just that change, just implementing CQRS has made this solution so much simpler, and that's why I say, yeah, we love CQRS, it's all about performance and simplicity and, and scalability, but really for me it's simplicity and this is, this is a reflection of that. So I might switch over to um, look at the to-do items controller in clean architecture now because it's reflective of, of where we're kind of at now. Okay, so the to-do items controller is very simple. Oops, where did it go? There we go. Um, so you can see it's actually implementing a base API controller. So that's something that's in this solution and its responsibility at the moment is just basically to decorate with the API controller a default route and then to um, inject mediator um, via property injection. So you can see here it just essentially requests the mediator service. So then we, know we don't need to do that for each controller. So you can see here um, in the get all method, we're basically just sending a mediator request. So our, our queries and commands are requests and everything goes through the mediator pipeline. So you can see how simple things have become. And, and that's, that's how we're building these today and that's how you'll build it if you're using um, this solution. So you can also see that for each of the queries, I'm taking the time to create well-defined view models. And what I want is for my client to request something, such as a to-do item, and to receive everything that they need to render that view. I don't want them to make additional API calls to receive more information. I want that view to be very well-defined and provide everything the client needs. And, and by the same way, I also want to be able to test that view. You know, if a button's meant to be disabled, I want to be able to test the view to see if the button should be disabled. So I can have um, properties like allow create. And that on the front end, that can be a silly binding just to a button. But on the back end, that allows me to write a unit test to see how the, how the view's going to respond. And so we're even encapsulating that kind of logic inside of Core. Now, one of my absolute favorite things with this solution is the um, open API integration. So we might launch this solution so we can have a look at that. So from the web UI project, all we have to do is go .NET run. Now I've currently got it configured um, so that it starts the Angular, um, sorry, Angular CLI server at the same time. Um, I've got a blog, the last blog post I did was at NDC Sydney last year, and there's a blog post that tells you all about that behavior and why you might want to disable it. So it might be worth checking out. So when we start this, it's going to launch the backend web API and it's going to launch the front-end Angular client. While that's happening, I want to show you a couple of pieces. You can see in WW root, I've got a specification file. Now that's being automatically generated by NSWAG. Who's heard of NSWAG? Awesome, almost 50% of the room. So NSWAG is an open API toolchain. It allows you to generate open API specifications and it also allows you to generate clients based off those specifications. So I have NSWAG um, actually generating the specification here and putting it into the WW root folder. Now using that, I'm able to generate an Angular client for my front end. 
And if I come in here, into app, into here, you can see the client. So this is a TypeScript client for interacting with this API. And so I don't have to write this code anymore. And, and what's more, all of those well-defined view models that I worked so hard to create, including the DTOs, are also generated for me. So when I go to interact with my API from the front end, if I have a look at, say, my to-do um, component, all I actually have to do is an inject the client that I want to work with and start working with it. So you can see this is me um, getting all of the to-do items. This is me creating a new to-do item. I didn't write any of that code. I didn't write this view model on the client. It's all being generated from the back end. So with something like NSWAG, we're actually bridging the gap between the back end and the front end. The source of truth remains our back end. It remains the core. And we generate what we need for the front end. And what's more, when it changes, I have NSWAG automatically rebuilding all of that. So if you have a look in the web UI, and you can see here, I've got two references, NSWAG ASP.NET Core and NSWAG MS Build. MS Build with NSWAG actually has this task. So when I build the web UI project, it runs NSWAG, and NSWAG will pick up a configuration file that I've generated, and it will build a new specification and put it in WW root, and it will build a new TypeScript client and put it in my Angular app, and I'm good to go, like it's set and forget. So not only do we have NSWAG, sorry, OpenAPI bridging the gap between the front end and the back end, we've also um, created an automation process with NSWAG where we never have to look at it again, unless it breaks. It just does sometimes, but that's okay. We can fix it. So let's have a look um, at that configuration. Oh, it's down a little bit further. So there's our NSWAG configuration. I didn't have to build that myself um, because NSWAG has a studio, which is very good at building configurations. Unfortunately, it's only for Windows, um, but I understand a lot of Mac users have Windows on the flip side, so that's okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we've got our um, application running now. So that's the Angular, but we don't want to go to the Angular one. We want to go to the um, ASP.NET Core one because it's being hosted by Kestrel. No, not right now. Thank you though. Oh. Sorry, what's that? Did I try up HTTP? Let's just let's let it handle it then. Oh, good. Thank you, JK. Okay, so you can see this is the sample app, and you can see it's got the basic things in the template. Also, my nice to-do list, so I can get things done. It's gonna ask me to log in, which is great. I'll go ahead and log in. There's my to-do list. Um, I, you might notice on the entity that I defined the key, instead of being an int, I've defined it as a long, because I feel like I have so much to do that two billion's gonna be a little bit of a limitation. <laughs> So let's get started. So I can add items, I can delete items, and I can mark them as complete. And, and remember, when I showed you the code behind that, that client was all generated, all the DTOs were all generated. And so that's the kind of experience. And this is what we're using for, for, for real projects as well. Now, behind the scenes, we have that um, open API happening, right, with NSWAG. We also are exposing Swagger UI and we've, we've provided a mechanism in which you can supply the bearer token so that we can try out those authenticated requests. So for those of you who don't know, Swagger UI is really great. It, you, it reads the specification, it generates an interface and allows us to learn about the API and it also allows us to interact with the API. So it's great if you're learning a new API and it's also great for your developers who need to test something out. So you see here, there's all of our different actions that are available um, our operations that are available for our to-do items, and here's our weather forecast. Um, I better grab a token so that, so that I can show you how that works. So if I grab that, control T, paste that in, I'm gonna get a token. If I go and fetch data, have a look at a network request, our token will be here. So 
you know, with this template um, that Microsoft's provided that integrates um, identity, we don't have to do as much work. They've really, um, I think it was mostly um, um, Dominic and Brock who, who, who contributed to this, identity servers built in, and behind the scenes in, um, in the Angular implementation, there's services, there's interceptors, there's guards, everything we basically need to get started. Anyway, I want to grab this token so I can show you um, making an authenticated request. So I grab that, I click authorize, I can paste that in, and I just need to trim off that first part. So we need everything including bearer and, and onwards. So we click authorize, we just hide that, and now we can make requests. So we go try it out, execute, and we get back our results, and that's good, and we can do that. Like we can create items, we can delete items, we can update items. Um, it's it's a really useful tool, and and you can see here, you know, it's not a, it's not a backdoor by any means. We still have to be authenticated. We still have to pass through a token, um, but it does allow us to troubleshoot and debug and, and learn about the API, which is wonderful. Um, so I promised to show you the exception middleware. So let me show you that now. Um, there we go. So it's very simple. Um, something, to, something definitely to build on. So I've got a custom exception middleware. Down the bottom, I have an extension for iApplication Builder. So if in, within startup.cs, we just go use custom exception handler. Um, I'll show you that really quickly. There you go. So just like that. So that wires it in. And then up the top here, you can see essentially any requests that come through, we'll look at them um, if they're an exception. We'll, we'll figure out um, what type of exception they are. If it's a validation exception, we'll change it to a bad request, or some people like to use unprocessable entity, we can do that too, um, whatever suits our needs. If it's a not found, we'll change it to a not found, um, and we'll provide some information. The, the validation exception actually uses this failures property, um, and what I'm doing there is just taking all of those fluent validation errors and um, putting it into a format that's just like model state. So if you're used to programming against model state on your front end, I want to provide the same experience. So whatever code you've got now, we'll continue to work with that. Uh, I should show you the current user service because it's, it's very simple, um, but it is an important part of the story. So for an authenticated user, um, we just grab the claim name identifier and that's the user ID so we can use that when we're um, trying to find out more about the user, such as their roles and that sort of thing. Um, I pass it into um, the identity service when I'm getting the username and that sort of thing. So pretty simple. Um, one thing that I've ne kind of neglected to show a little bit are the tests. Um, I'll, I'll probably just show you the web UI tests. Um, they're really great. So I've got tests for the controller. And this is a test for the create method. And so you can see here that I've, I've got a, a method that I've created, which is client, which gets an authenticated client so that I don't have to deal with that. It's got a test user behind the scenes, and we can actually then um, test requests against the API. And these tests are really powerful. We can test a lot when we test against the API layer because it's exercising a lot of the stack. Um, so when you write these tests, you can see they're really simple to write, but, but they have a big payoff. Um, I've also got tests for um, infrastructure, so you can see I've got some application DB context tests to test my auditable entity behaviors, so you can see how that works. And in the domain and application layer, I have tests that will work with the commands and queries, um, including providing a, um, an in-memory DB context so that you can write very effective tests. And they're quite simple to write too. So if you have a look at this one, we can test the create to do items command. Um, we don't have to deal with the context because that's provided by the base class. It's all injected for us and we can write very simple tests. So, so that was a, um, a big goal for me was to be able to write really effective tests, not have to for each project wire up all of the authentication needs, all of the in-memory needs, just be able to um, use this project and get started. So key points, controllers should not contain any application logic. That logic is not easy to use, uh, to reuse. We want that outside, um, sorry, inside of our core. We should create and consume well-defined view models. We don't want our clients to think too much for themselves. Just provide them everything they need and let them render the view. 
Open API bridges the gap between the front end and back end. You saw how we've done that. We're generating clients and we're generating DTOs. It makes our life very easy. Code that we would have had to have written ourselves in the past. And NSWAG, in this case, is automating the generation of open API um, specification and the clients that we need. We didn't see it here today, but you can also generate C-sharp clients, fetch clients. There's um, a great lot of options that you can use within this tool. So next steps. So if you like what you saw today, then you might want to install the solution template. So to do that, all you have to do is run .NET new install clean architecture solution template. And then you can create a new solution by running .NET new CA-SLN, so clean architecture solution. So I'll demonstrate that for you really quickly. So from our command window, we go .NET new install clean architecture solution template, just like that. So this is backed by a NuGet package. I updated it um, last night at about midnight and I updated it again at about 9 a.m. and I updated it again at about tw um, 12 midday. I've been working on it a lot. Um, but you can see here, we now have this short name, the Clean Architecture Solution and CA Solution. So if we want to create a new project, um, let's make a directory, NDC Sydney 2019. Okay, and then we can go .NET, new CA solution, clean architecture solution. It will generate that and everything that you've seen here today will be ready for you to use um, and correctly named space based on the directory that you created it in. So if we come in here, we can see we've got an NDC Sydney solution. We've got our layers ready to use, all of our tests, including the infrastructure associated with those tests ready to use. And it's all namespaced, as I said, um, to based on um, you know, the folder name that you specified. So you're basically ready to just get underway. So thank you very much for attending my talk today. Um, I hope you've liked what you saw. Um, if you did, be sure to install the template. Also check out the repository. Um, this was only made possible through the contributions of thousands of people around the world. So I'm hoping that we can see the same sort of effort with the clean architecture template. Don't be afraid to ask the tough questions. Sometimes I get stumped, I'm still learning. Um, but in the end, we, we end up with a better solution. Thank you.